Uh, I was I grew up in Christchurch. Well, I went to Union Christchurch, and uh, my the core of my calling is to Japan. But uh, we planted a church in Japan, and uh, out of that church in Japan, God uh, really stirred our hearts to have the church for Africa, for Mozambique, Japan, and, uh, Christchurch. Yeah, Mozambique. Malaysia too. Church planting in Malaysia for a while too. But um, the main thing has been Japan and to Mozambique. That's the story today. Very cool. Yes. Look forward to hearing about Okay, that. okay. Um, yes, yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of a background of the work there. Um, as I said, just uh, God just stirred our hearts in Japan as we prayed, as we saw Him. He opened a door, cutting many stories short, um, opened a door into northern Mozambique, into this uh, coastal town called Angosh, very small town, very remote, which is a blessing in many ways. Um, and uh, they, there we found uh, an open door to share the gospel with the Koti people, Koti nation, who live in Angosh, along the coast, and in small islands just off the coast. Um, we began visiting, just really seeking the Lord for an open door, and uh, ended up um, talking with the tribal chief of the Koti people on one of these islands, just sharing the gospel with him. These are hardcore Muslim people, um, just totally, totally rabid Muslim. And uh, the friends that had introduced us were very kind of cautious, nervous about even going there because of their hostility to the gospel. But this guy uh, just listened. He said, I open this, the, the islands to you. I want you to take this message to all the Koti Islands. Uh, and uh, we, we asked him. I always had a little notepad in my pocket. Asked him the names of the islands, jotted them down. And uh, we headed off back to the mainland. But we got caught in a storm along the way. Um, and uh, night came, we were blown up the coast um, and uh, ended up on this uh, tiny little sandbar of an island, a bit bigger than a football field. And again, at night, I had flashcards and, and a torch, as you do, and uh, shared the gospel with these people. And uh, they, they asked us to come back, Muslim people asked us to come back and continue to teach them. And God just opened the door there, and out of that little sandbar of an island, God raised up really wonderful, wonderful um, disciples, apostolic men who are now taking the gospel right through the Koti nation and to other nations. And uh, so um, that island was was on a journey to nowhere. That's what it was like when we arrived. And uh, then it became more like that, and then like that. And we were just there in uh, September last year, and that's all that was left of the island. It was eroding. Um, and uh, I've often thought if we hadn't have gone and God said to go, this is what we would have found. We would have missed the open door into that whole nation. Um, so now, um, from that little island community, the gospel has gone out. We have something like 1,200 Koti people who have been baptized and then they've taken the gospel to the Makua who live around them, um, who are not so hardcore Muslim and respond a little bit more readily. So we end up um, having more Makua come to the Lord than we than Koti, but that, that's okay, we keep focused on the Koti. Um, and uh, from there also, they, we've sent out three teams, um, church planting in a totally different people group, about uh, 800 kilometers further north. Um, so 150 communities of faith, we, we avoid um, Christian language, they're Muslims, and we try to stay within the Muslim culture and context. Um, and we, we are not, I'm not speaking as a person who's expert in the areas of development. Uh, my passion is church planning and discipling, and, uh, but the same issue is longevity, sustainability, isn't it? Um, building a work that will go from generation to generation to generation. And when I drop off the planet, they'll continue pressing on and uh, multiplying following Jesus. And so, so heart transformation really is, is total key for us. That they've got a internalize the gospel. The gospel is the passion that I have has got to become the passion that they have and they're not doing the work because we've uh, psyched them up to do it or because of anything except the passion, the burning love for Jesus that's in their hearts. And uh, we, we just see how God has transformed people. I, I like this picture. You don't take so many pictures of people before they come to the Lord because you just don't interact them, with them like that. But I happen to have this one. The lady on the far right this was, there's a before and after shot, you know, so blowing it up is like that, and over here is what she is now. Um, 
before we went there, her husband was womanizer, was beating her, was uh, um, drunk, was just doing anything, and she was a miserable lady. But uh, that night that we landed there on the storm, he repented. He changed the way he was living, and now they're missionaries um, a thousand kilometers further north, and just to transform the family. And that's the story of many people. This guy was also um, womanizing, drunk. He had a different woman every month. Um, would, would take a woman in, would uh, kick her out after a month and go and find somebody else. Just a, a horrible man. And uh, we shared the gospel with him. He repented. He was baptized and with, his, with the woman of the month. And um, now, eight years later, she's still there with him. And, uh, and beautifully, his, his little daughter that was baptized with him has uh, married one of our key young men. And, and they're just, just a core part of the work, transformed by the power of the gospel. And uh, with that passion, it's not um, because we're there watching over them, but because they've met with Jesus. So we, we preach a very strong repentance message. Turn away from sin, turn away from witchcraft, turn away from adultery, from fornication, from every uncleanness. Follow Jesus, follow Jesus. And, uh, and they do that, and they do that. And the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we seek the working of the Spirit in people's hearts. It's not just head knowledge, um, but they, they, they are transformed. Um, and the second thing we go for is cultural transformation. As a Muslim community, we, we don't want them to become part of the Christian Christendom that's around about them. There's a lot of um, Christianity in Africa that, as you will have heard people say, is a mile wide and an inch deep. And uh, we, we don't want them learning from that. We want them to just be passionate to follow Jesus within the Koti community. And so that means developing forms of following Jesus that are consistent with the Koti way of life. Um, a very simple illustration is the way we do funerals. We do it the way the Koti Muslim community do it, rather than the way they do it in churches. But there are, there are a lot of, lot of issues around this, which of course I can't go into in any, any great detail. But uh, Islam spread around that coast through Madrasa that was uh, conducted by Imams, by Malimu, who um, visited the area mo mostly um, about a hundred years ago. It was, uh, it's been there for hundreds of years, but intensely um, through Madrasa, where the Portuguese colonial government didn't provide um, schools for the Muslim people. And so the only option for their kids was to learn um, through, through the Madrasa that the Imams were offering. And so they learned to read Arabic, and they learned to become rabid Muslim. Um, now, of course, the whole country is functioning in Portuguese, and parents actually want their kids to succeed in school, which means in Portuguese. Uh, at the same time, we want them to be able to function in Koti, and the language of worship and of their following Jesus has to be the language of their hearts and of their community, which is Koti. And so uh, we want the kids to succeed in school by learning Koti before they get to school. So we have this madrasa, which is to teach them literacy, and uh, to disciple them, we have about 2,000 kids that are attending like four times a week. Um, and it's just an awesome way of seeing the gospel become part of the Koti community. And I used to walk the streets and see um, the, the parents coming to faith and see the kids still in, in madrasa at the, at the mosque and think, unless we reach the kids and have our own madrasa, we're not going to see this whole thing survive. Um, the, parent, the kids are going to go with their friends. They're, Believing kids are going to go with their friends to Madrasa because that's where all their friends go. But now they go and learn about Jesus and pull their Muslim friends along to that. And parents have come to faith because of the testimony of their kids in the Madrasa. Um, this, is, this is what our youth looked like a few years ago, which I don't know if you can see anything odd about that, um, the, the young people in our town work. This is not in the villages, this is in the town. Anything unusual about that group? All male. All male. And uh, that was what we realized, they're all male. And in the village, everybody comes to faith and family, so there are girls and guys. But in the town, um, the whole Koti culture is, is very, it's not matriarchal technically, it's matrilineal, but it is, it is quite matriarchal. It's, very, it's driven by very, very strong women who are very involved in witchcraft and in Islam. And uh, the men are soft and open to the gospel, but the women have been slow. And we saw a key to this whole thing was the, what, they, what we call the virgin ceremony. When girls come of age, they um, just go through this demonic process of invoking spirits of lust. And they change from being quite nice kids to becoming voluptuous, horrible young ladies. And uh, they don't want to follow Jesus. And so we, we went into 
three in cutting kind of long story short to develop a, a new way of dedicating our girls to the Lord and uh, just have seen a huge transformation where we have um, many girls coming to celebrate the, the, the virgin ceremony before the Lord to de dedicate themselves to the Lord to wait for the guy that he prepares for them to marry um, as virgins in the presence of the Lord and these are just two of our, our beautiful girls who have recently been married and um, as virgins married in the presence of the Lord married to passionate young Koti men and uh, it's a total new thing there's never been Koti kids that have married as virgins um, and uh, so this is this is new culture um, but it's Koti culture because we're still doing it within the community it's not taking them outside into any other community um, heart transformation, cultural transformation, investing in leaders obviously is a huge part of seeing longevity to the work. Um, we have weekly training where, um, and uh, yeah, I'll just crash on. Um, every Wednesday we gather 30 young people, 30 uh, people together, trainers, who um, then 30 split up two by two and conduct that same training in 15 different locations. And so. We can't bring 400 people into Angosh every, every week, but we can minister to three or 400 people in these 15 different locations, um, in these 15 different zones. And uh, so there in the zones, they have a uh, ministry of the word just to build them up as men of God. They have a, a lesson that they can take and use in their community. Uh, they pray together, they share reports, and of course, they have lunch. Um, bicycles are a part of getting there, and. Uh, Bright Hope have been awesomely helpful for us in getting bicycles for these guys. It's a simple thing. Um, it may seem a simple thing, but some of these guys were walking 35, 45, 50 kilometers to the training. Um, and, uh, and guys came to me saying their legs are swollen just because of the, the amount of walking that they were doing with, uh, with, as part of the training. They need bicycles, but the bicycles that we buy last for about three years because the, the roads that they're used on are not made for bicycles and the bicycles are not made for those roads, but they're the best that you can get. They're pretty strong, strong bicycles, but uh, yeah, there's a, they need, we need to be recycling bicycles and, and uh, re, re, uh, replanting the bicycles. It's just a, an ongoing thing. Um, and uh, just the dedication of these guys, I mean, we've, we had them just sometimes sleeping on the road on the way to get there because they have to leave so, so much earlier to get to the training. Do the training, you have to feed them. <laughs> you can't send them home on an empty stomach to cycle another 30 kilometers, 50 kilometers, or by boat or whatever. And so those are, those are costs which are involved in, in making the work happen, and uh, we are committed to, to, to doing that. Um, to, because I, for me, I, I have worked at, like I just briefly mentioned, in Malaysia and jungle villages there, and, and you realize that the, the, the end product of what we are doing is what the people in the village get from a very, very poorly trained worker. Um, it's not what they get in the town from the rather well-trained worker who's had opportunity to learn from a lot of other situations, but it's the guy who's full-time doing his harvesting, doing his, um, doing his uh, farming or whatever, and yet while he's doing it, he's also shepherding the people and gathering them together for worship sometime during the week and, and ministering to them in a, in, a, in a, what to say, not, not a very well-trained process, uh, something that a lot of the people would come to on Sunday and fall asleep very easily. And so um, we need to serve those guys in the village, in the, in the extremities, to make sure they're giving, I mean, it's bad language, but giving the best product to their people that they can, so their people are fed and, and encouraged and built up and pastored and inspired and healed and, and uh, helped to follow Jesus with passion. And so we need to be there for those 400 guys helping them to do that. Um, so that's a, that's a big passion of ours. Um, the leadership is, is very, very strong. Wonderful men that uh, Jerry and John have met, and of course um, Kevin has. Um, just visionary, but always plural leadership, very flat leadership, very consultative. Foot washing is just an expression of their hearts for each other. Um, and very proactive about bringing young leaders into the core leadership team. Um, and involving them in the work, seeing, um, seeing the young leaders really equipped. And, and there's a process, isn't there, of blooding young guys, that they don't just come in on the coattails of the older guys and have it all dished up to them on a, on a silver plate and inherit leadership, which is some of the kind of second-generation leadership issues that we sometimes see. But seeing these young guys also going out 
um, into the one on the far right just recently has just taken the call to go to a really, really um, difficult island situation and pioneer there and just seeing God break open, seeing um, multiple Muslim leaders just uh, the last time we went there, just on the same day, four different village elders said, yes, we'll follow Jesus, down to the water, baptized that day, committing themselves to follow Christ and just opening up that whole community. And he and his wife said, yep, we'll come. And two weeks later, they're there living there with their kids and uh, doing the hard yards as they come into, in the future, a leadership for the whole movement. Um, so yeah, we're pretty excited. Um, this is another one of those young couples that we've just sent a couple of weeks ago, gone to Nairobi. Um, and we've sent numbers of our young people, no numbers, just uh, four others, I think, um, outside. Main goal, honestly speaking, is to become competent in English. Um, if they're going to be key leaders for this work, they need to be able to interface with, with uh, Kevin and others when they come through, need to be able to speak some English. Um, and uh, in terms of going for discipleship training in Kenya, I honestly, I wouldn't see them. Right? They're doing the stuff. I mean, he's reaching his Muslim neighbors with incredible anointing and grace and so much favor. I wouldn't send him for that training, but I want him to be able to communicate in English. And while he's there, he'll see a lot of other stuff and learn from it, see some good stuff, see some not so good stuff. But that will all increase his capacity to be a leader for the movement in the future. And that's just uh, some of our young leaders um, that we gather together um, to minister to um, and uh, invest in them and see them coming and carry more and more of a responsibility for the work in the future. Um, if you're interested in finding a little bit more about the story, you can look at Island Flame on YouTube. Um, and if you want to find out any more, there's some points of connection there. There you wow. go. We're having fun. So come and visit. Um, join John and Jerry and, and come and have a look.